Well, they say the man who never made a mistake never made anything. This is the story of Admiral Tryon, George Tryon, who made a pretty crucial mistake. Now, when we make a mistake, there's usually a, an undo button or a control Z, but no control Z in life. When we make mistakes, there's usually a reason. We're, um, we're tired and emotional or drunk or frazzled or too, doing too many, too many things at the one time or doing something we don't really know what, anything about. Sometimes the cogs in the mind just slip and for no apparent reason we make a mistake and have no idea why we've made that mistake or how we misunderstood what was going on. Usually it's trivial. In this case, it was tragic. Now, Admiral George Tryon was the Admiral of the fleet in the Mediterranean, and he was doing exercises. Not exercises, fleet exercises. And he had two columns of ships, the left-hand column and the right-hand column, he was in, he, heading the right-hand column in the ship called HMS Victoria. His second in command was in the front of the left-hand column in Camperdown. The idea was these two columns of ships, steaming side by side, were heading east towards Tripoli, generally towards Syria. And uh, they intended to come back towards their anchorage points. And then when they reached their anchorage, they were all going to turn smartly 90 degrees and they were going to drop anchors together simultaneously. There was going to be the ship's blacksmith standing in the foredeck of each ship with a hammer ready to knock out the pins or the shackles or whatever held up the chain so that all the anchors would fall together. That was the plan. It was going to be beautiful. When he came to turn around, these ships were travelling 800 to 1,000 yards apart. He issued an instruction via flag signals that the left-hand column turn to the right and the right hand column would turn to the left. His second in command Markham dithered about this and was about to semaphore him to query this strange situation when he got an instruction from the Admiral via flag saying what are you waiting for? So the two front two ships they were all going to turn one after the other. Front two ships began to turn towards each other and a calamity ensued. The Admiral even lost his own life in this. Now, this is a few decades after the Crimea, so you might be forgiven for thinking this is a typical blunder, that this is some kind of uh, some kind of chinless wonder who uh, bought his own commission and spent his time designing his own uniforms uh, and licking the arses of royalty before leading his men to slaughter. No, that was the army way. This was the Royal Navy. A uh, bit more of a meritocracy, I guess, because ships are harder to replace than men. But... Uh, this guy was a high achiever. He'd gone to sea at 16 and he, a uh, Northamptonshire fella, his brothers joined the army. He, he went to sea, he ended up in an interesting ship called the Wellesley um, that was uh, on the eastern seaboard of the US, I suppose the Caribbean, British, British properties there. Um, the Wellesley was sailing in company with a steamship, a, a paddle steamer. And when the uh, wind dropped, the paddle steamer would tow the Wellesley which was a ship of the line, a twin deck 74 gun ship of the line. The paddle steamer would tow that and she would then, when the, when the wind got up to save coal, she would tow the paddle steamer, which is kind of bizarre. I never heard of that before. Some kind of early Toyota Prius effort. The Greens would be delighted. But uh, the interesting thing about that ship actually, the Wellesley, she was laid down in 1815, called after the Duke of Wellington and sunk by the Luftwaffe in 1940. She was tied alongside basically a floating hulk in London docks and uh, sunk by the Luftwaffe during the Blitz and uh, her timbers ended up being used in the Royal Courts of Justice. There you go. But he jumped up the ranks. Everywhere he went, he impressed people and uh, he was no fool. He got to, uh, got to the Crimea and he was, a, he was a, a signals midshipman. So he'd be up in the cross trees watching the battles of the Alma and the Inkerman that his brothers were fighting in. Uh, on the way back from the uh, Crimea through the Aegean, the, the ship he was on then sprang a leak around the propeller propeller, propeller shaft and uh, they were taking on a load of water. Um, the pumps couldn't handle it. But they had a sort of a steam boiler that was using uh, coolant uh, by taking water from the sea. So they diverted, they jury rigged those pumps like something Scotty would do on Star Trek. 
they, they diverted those pumps to the bilge so that they were actually taking cooling water then from the bilge and with those pumps working as well they managed to keep her afloat till they beached her on an island in the Aegean and it was George Tryon who was sent rather than a senior officer sent to get help for his marked intelligence as his captain said. So as I said he was a high achiever jumped up the ranks he was uh, joined at 16 so he was a bit he was two years beyond other people joined at 14 but maybe that gave him more uh, more maturity and, and helped him climb the ranks but he was playing catch up in the initial years did well was with the Royal Yacht for a while and um, was appointed to commissions to re-examine the flag book as flags was a big thing and quite an unwieldy system Tryon even developed his own system called the TA system T was for Tryon can't remember what the, uh, the A was for but basically it was a system of short a, a shorthand for signalling now he uh, went to Australia for a while and was involved in setting up the first squadron based on the colonies of Australia they weren't weren't working together they were separate colonies but uh, he came up with the idea that they'd club together to form one naval squadron a fund one naval squadron which was like um, he's highly regarded in Australia for having sold the seeds for the Royal Australian Naval Service there but um, he uh, ended up then uh, as Admiral of the Fleet um, he was a man known to be uh, quite quite uh, quite formidable to work for but uh, but competent you know um, he liked people to use their own initiative and that's partly the problem here his uh, his second in command was a guy called Markham Markham had been uh, he went to sea at 15 uh, at 15 he was fighting Chinese pirates and uh, then he uh, like one raid he was on they were uh, him and other boy sailors and submarines were raiding some Chinese junk and they rescued two rescue British sailors they found the sailors had been crucified they uh, rescued some Chinese men who were then uh, pirates who were then beheaded it was all rather meaty stuff and then he uh, took up bird watching and as you do and uh, he even then got involved in some Arctic exploration but to get some experience for that he left the Navy briefly and uh, became a second mate on a whaler just to get some experience for the Arctic and then uh, did some Arctic exploration of the Royal Navy was down in the Antipodes and he was the man who designed the New Zealand flag so he was the second in command when this happened and this all went wrong because basically Tryon said turn inwards ships back then it was an interesting time um, it was in between the wooden walled ships ships of the line square rigged um, the uh, ca cannon firing broadsides it was in between that and the dreadnought modern era of ships and in between the two these ironclads are pre-dreadnoughts they were a fascinating selection of shapes and sizes it would have been a great time if you were a ship designer a naval architect uh, because people were, were, were just free thinking and uh, like the the monitor and the Merrimack in the American Civil War that had inspired some um, the, the ship that was uh, uh, the Victoria that, that Tryon was on that had a big round turret uh, and a very low deck foredeck that was a bit like the um, one of the monitor of the Merrimack I forget which is which and uh, other ships the Russians had tall ships with with very sloping sides tumble home sides the French had ships that had turrets and things that looked like floating hotels at times uh, you know I'd love to see a movie made with them they had a real uh, a real steampunk kind of aesthetic going on but um, I, I digress I digress uh, the Camperdown it had a ram see back then they thought rams might be uh, still a, a tactic so the, the bow had a, a ram and when the two ships were coming together the obvious became inevitable and the inevitable became obvious and uh, all too late they started to put their engines into a stern uh, put, put their engines astern and try and turn harder now Tryon had said to the captain of the Victoria when he'd asked to put the engines astern Tryon had said no 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 and then yes 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 and uh, too late they tried uh, they hadn't on the camper down they hadn't put their wheel hard over they could have turned further to starboard they um, but practice was you go so far with the wheel because I guess going all the way uh, is actually bad for the equipment but um, in hindsight when they looked at it all afterwards they could have put one screw forward and the other screw astern giving themselves more of a turn that way and they could have gone further could have gone hard over but they didn't anyway their ram 
connected with the Victoria smashed into the ship now it was a make and mend day it was an easy going day the uh, the off duty watches were hanging around in their messes or on deck uh, loads of hatches were open scuttles were open watertight doors were all open it was quite relaxed um, changed pretty quickly fellas were trying to get down below wading through water trying to close doors cl close hatches and um, people were getting trapped behind watertight doors and they kept the engines going they tried to turn the ship to get it to the coast the engine crew stayed working on the engines um, but the list uh, increased increased and eventually they basically had to uh, get everybody call everybody on deck and, and abandon ship they never told the engineers they were abandoning ship they went down with the ship the captain made it onto the chart house roof with the, the the admiral and the captain both made it to the chart house roof uh, Tryon was hurt to say it's all my fault it's all my fault um, because the engines were stern when they collided they they were each doing about five knots when they collided when Camperdown pull, pulled out because the her engines were in the stern uh, all the water rushed in and made, made things worse Camperdown also listed also took on a lot of water and then they uh, basically had to uh, deal with that uh, but they kept her afloat and saved it other boat other ships put boats in the water tried to get as many of the survivors as they could but they uh, they recovered six bodies but 358 men died including Tryon so uh, a bit of a disaster to say the least needless to say there was recriminations and accusations and arse covering afterwards and there was a court martial at which the entire crew were present as well those who weren't in hospital were present as prisoners before the court on trial for the loss of their ship basically what the court martial said was that uh, Tryon was responsible did say that Markham could have done more but uh, you know he could have sent him forward for clarification but Tryon wasn't that kind of guy um, to recreate battle conditions he wanted his people to be able to use their initiative it speculated maybe he misjudged the turning circle that for radius for diameter or diameter for radius maybe he thought that um, he hardly mixed up port starboard but maybe he thought one would turn outside the other maybe he assumed that the other ship would give way to his ship and go outside maybe he assumed that the others assumed he might give some clarifying orders later or so they said but uh, be that as it may that was what happened that is the end of George Tryon and 357 other souls illustrious career one tremendous error now there's an echo in modern times with that idea of somebody who is uh, second in command speaking up and um, when you look at the uh, Tenerife air crash that happened in 1977 77 79 77 I think um, big air two 747s before 9-11 it was the worst loss of life and for a single two plane crashes it's the worst lo loss of life ever now what happened was basically just foggy for various reasons there was planes stacked up on the uh, runways due to a bomb scare on another island it's very interesting to see how that uh, crash happened but there was a Dutch plane at the end of the runway in the fog anxious to go really anxious to go there was United uh, was it American plane was it United Airways an American plane anyway Pan Am can't remember American plane was landing and on the runway he couldn't get off onto the taxiways because they were filled up with other planes that had been diverted because of the bomb scare so he stayed on tower was directing him to go down and take a, a side road told the KLM flight stay where it was KLM thought he heard clearance he was told to wait for clearance KLM pilot started to go the co-pilot was heard afterwards on the tape hesitantly questioning the pilot the pilot was very experienced top pilot in KLM his face was actually on billboard advertisements he had trained all the other pilots he was the top man he didn't the co-pilot didn't query him strongly enough he barreled down the runway into the fog into the oncoming American plane horrendous loss of life there's a book uh, Stephen Barley has a book I have it here um, final call about what's learned or not learned from air crashes he talks about a study that was done after that into the propensity for different people to actually speak up against their uh, their 
superiors. Um, it's a bit of a problem with me- Middle Eastern Airlines apparently where the, the captain might be uh, minor royalty or something and uh, the two nationalities that were found to be most likely to contradict their captain were, or to speak up to their captain were the Irish and the Australians. Now I don't normally like sweeping statements about nationalities because life has told me how clumsy and, and incomplete they are but uh, I don't mind that one. Anyway, now I hope you enjoy that. Um, hope you found something interesting there. You can look it up. There is a book um, ca- about this called When Admirals Collide or Admirals in Collision, one or the other, by a fella called Richard Hock. H O U G H. Is that pronounced Hock? Hock as in lock, or how as in bow, or haw like ought. Or huff, like rough, or huff, like cough, or who, like through, or ho, like although. It's uh, it's no wonder the English are good at code breaking. Right, hope you enjoyed that. Think I'm getting the hang of these, I might do more. Bye now. Mind yourselves. Okay, here's a little, uh, a little bonus material, um, a little life hack for you. Uh, and a little test for me because uh, I'm recording this bit uh, with both my phone and my digital SLR to see how they look. So this here now is on the digital SLR which is what I normally use and uh, just out of uh, for comparison purposes I'm going to switch now to my phone. Um, so what I was going to talk to you about here was uh, a little life hack um, if you use rechargeable batteries something you might be interested to know is if you have a battery that uh, won't charge on the charger that's rejected you can jump start it from a good battery just takes 10 seconds or so and uh, you can then uh, get a little bit of a charge into it that you put it on the charger then the charger will see it again and start charging so when you thought you had to throw away a battery and buy a new one you might not and um, you probably won't actually so there you go that might help you all right that's a little test over bye now